So it's Tuesday, the 31st of August, and I am uh, sitting here at the Raleigh Durham Airport. It's about 8.30. I'm awaiting the arrival of Nick Palmashano. He's uh, been in the Middle East for the past nine days. And uh, so when he gets in, I'm going to grab him and drag him out to the office and interview him with a couple of cameras and see uh, see what's been going on. He uh, called us all in the office about eight days ago, nine days ago, and said uh, that he and Tim Kennedy had been contacted by a couple of people in Washington and they were getting a group of vets together to go and see if they couldn't help with the evacuation process. And other than a couple of Facebook messages or Instagram posts, uh, really haven't talked to Nick at all while he was gone. Uh, he texted me about three hours ago to let me know that he'd landed in Atlanta. He was back in the U.S. So I drove out here and I'm going to grab him and send him down and find out what really went on and what really happened and what the situation was really like over there. So, uh, Nick, tell me about your last 24 hours. The last 24 hours? 24 hours. Um, in the last 24 hours, I, uh, I, I rode into Athens, Greece, after meeting with the consulate in Albania, then met with uh, a very powerful NGO um, in Greece. Both of those visits were to move refugees into those countries. Um, we've already placed 300 refugees into an amazing resort in Albania, uh, and I believe we're going to be able to do the same thing in Greece. Then I hopped on a plane back uh, to the United States with Tim Kennedy. Tim and I flew into Atlanta, and uh, I just landed here in Raleigh about 20 minutes ago. Let's start at the beginning. How how did this all come about? I mean, one minute you're at Tim Kennedy's house working on his book, and the next minute you've been in the Middle East and Afghanistan for the past seven, eight days. So how did it happen? Yeah, I, I can definitely say that I never expected to be on a, on a mission like this. Um, you know, the, the Taliban just blasted through Afghanistan so fast that it put both our troops and our allies in a really precarious position. Um, it didn't look like the government was going to be able to react fast enough to get people out. And so, uh, you know, a series of people, myself included, started putting together manifests of information, um, you know, interpreters that people needed to get out. And, and we started you know, like putting these into spreadsheets and then there were like a group of us that were doing it. Um, simultaneous to that, uh, our, our good friend, um, Chad Robichaud had been trying to get his interpreter out. He had done 10 deployments with uh, this interpreter named Aziz. Um, and he was getting desperate because it, it didn't look like the government had a, had a plan in place. Uh, that was going to get him out in time. So he was he was planning a trip of just four or five guys just to get Aziz out and, and started making connections. Um, while he was doing this, there were some gentlemen at the Willard Hotel in D.C. that were figuring out a way to land some planes into Kabul to get people out. They... Um, have a connection to uh, our good friend, Sarah Verardo, who runs the Independence Fund. Um, Sarah and Chad and these folks at the Willard uh, were talking and um, Sarah and Chad texted, uh, both texted me within a few minutes of each other and uh, Chad texted Tim, hey, we could really use some help. Um, this is what we're doing. There weren't a lot of details. Uh, we didn't know if there were planes. We didn't know um, exactly what any of it looked like, but it was like two people that we really trust needed help. And so Tim and I just looked at each other and said, okay. So uh, 48 hours later, um, we were on you know, a, a flight to, uh, to the Middle East. Um, we landed in uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, UAE is the 
is the host country. That's not readily known yet, but uh, the press has cracked the code on that, so we're, we won't be giving away any secrets. Um, how that happened is simultaneous to them reaching out and, and talking to, to Tim and I, uh, they reached out to a gentleman uh, who's an absolute stud by the name of Sean Gabler. And Sean Gabler was our, our ground commander. Um, Sean went over there with no plan in place, just him and one other guy, what we're just gonna call Kevin. Um, and Sean and Kevin were the forward element. Um, they landed on the ground, didn't know where they were staying. They had a hotel at first. They linked up with the UAE government. Um, UAE was, uh, was amazing. I mean, truly amazing. They, um, in rapid, rapid fire, they set up the team in their military officer school, which is one of the nicest buildings I've ever seen. Our, our military is definitely doing it wrong. I'll say, I'll say that. Everything was marble, uh, gorgeous, um, you know, truly, truly took care of us and gave us the use of uh, two C-17s. So it was an Air Force facility? It, it, was, uh, it, was, it was not an Air Force facility, it was a uh, officer school, but um, they had a military airstrip about 20 minutes away that was an Air Force facility, um, and there were a couple C-17s that we essentially were allowed to use free of charge, which was amazing. Um, so, you know, when, when we arrived, um, Gabler had built up his group a little bit more. So, you know, very quickly, everybody reacted the same way that Tim and I did. So um, the group that was on the ground when we arrived were, it was uh, Gabler, uh, Kevin. Um, they, were, they were essentially the ground force at the time. And then Joe Robert, Sean Lee, um, both veterans, um, uh, Dan, who, who ran our whole top, absolute, absolute stud. Um, he's done, he's done everything, been everywhere. One of those guys. Um, and that was basically it. Uh, that's basically who was there. Um, and then another, uh, gentleman, Dave Johnson, who had been in the talk, and, but kind of jumped between ground and, and the talk. That, that was the group. Um, and when, when we landed there, these guys were exhausted. I mean, just, ex everyone was exhausted. Um, the, the folks in Abu Dhabi uh, were rotating to Kabul. Um, they were sleeping about an hour a day you know, jumping back and forth with planes to Kabul and, uh, you know, and running the talk and making sure the guys were safe and, and building target lists and getting those target lists approved in DC. And once they were approved, getting them manifested. Um, and so at first, the very first mission, um, they got out 30 people. I think it was actually 26 people on that first C-17. So they had this whole bird land and only 26 people got on. And it was like, all right, you know, this is kind of, you know, we're happy we got 26 out, but that's an awfully big bird only to get 26 people out. Um, that, that changed rapidly. Uh, we integrated with State Department. We integrated with DO, DOD. They gave us our own ramp at, at the Kabul Airport, Ramp 9. We had our own hangar. Um, we were, a, we were uh, on the military, the actual military jock, so we were an asset uh, that the military was coordinating with. So, you know, a couple people online kind of made it sound like we were doing cowboy shit, but it was, it was very different than that. It was, a, it was, even though there were only 12 of us, it was a very well-run, coordinated um, deal. It was really, really impressive. What, uh, and I, I, give, I give, you know, the majority of the credit to to Sean Gabler and to Dan, uh, but I mean it was truly impressive. And so, so you were totally in communication 
with the government, the military, the U.S. there. Oh, for sure. So just talk about that for a second, a little bit more. Yeah, so the military was not allowed to go outside the wire, period. That was, that was the rules of engagement. They were not allowed to go outside of the wire. The news has treated the Taliban very well. Uh, a lot of people were murdered right outside of the wire by the Taliban to show that they could do it. Um, you know, just random AK sprays into the crowd for the shit of it, people's heads cut off. Um, a lot of unkind things were happening outside the wire and uh, and I give the I give the troops a lot of credit because the desperation outside the wire coupled with their inability to do anything about it um, is probably going to weigh heavily on, on those men and women for a long time so the only people that were allowed to go outside the wire were uh, I'll just say special special units um, and so our ground team was essentially one of those special units that were allowed to go outside the wire. So, um, and that was because they had a great deal of confidence in, in Sean Gabler and, in, and Kevin. And then, um, so, you know, as we landed, um, these guys were just so smoked and uh, we just jumped right into the rotation. There was no time for like, oh, we're gonna sleep, we're gonna, you know, we're going to figure things out. Um, Tim and I uh, showered, got an hour nap, then we were up, and shortly thereafter we were on a flight from Abu Dhabi to Kabul. Um, this was now on a charter because uh, at this point the guys were filling uh, these C-17s and they needed more capacity. Um, and they, they wanted to have, you know, uh, we, we, we were able to, to link up with some generous individuals that provided us charter planes. And so Tim and I flew this charter plane out. It was just Tim and I on the plane, Tim and I and the crew. And, um, you know, we we're talking to the crew and the crew is all uh, Afghan. And they're all trying to get their families out. And, um, you know, they asked us if, if we could get their families out. And we promised that we would try, and uh, and we meant it. You know, we got everybody's information and built a built a manifest and tried to get locations and uh, and all that, and um, you know, landed on the ground in Afghanistan. And um, I've never seen an airstrip as wild as <laughs> as as what what was going on there. So the plane lands, taxis stops in front of ramp nine. Um, you know, they, they wheel up the, uh, the staircase and like on the ground, this is where I meet, uh, Sean Gabler and Kevin for the first time. Um, this is where I meet Dave Johnson for the first time, um, meet a whole bunch of other guys from another organization. Um, the guy that sticks with me the most is, you know, one dude is, uh, uh, is an amputee. And he's literally running the show down there, like running up and down stairs, you know, pulling people, pushing people, like, uh, search, you know, searching people. Um, and, you know, typically like a runway is very clean. It, you know, there's no trash, there's, um, you know, no vehicles. And like, I stepped off the plane, jumped into a, a vehicle with Kevin and, uh, you know, we're driving like under, under moving planes in like a, not an M Gator, but whatever the hell the new one is. Um, while they're moving, you know, people are everywhere. There's no tower. Um, you know, it's like, it's like one guy on a radio running the airstrip, just nuts. Um, and there's just lines and lines of people that, you know, are in the different hangars. Like we, you know, our hangar was was uh, very organized, but then you also had the PAX terminal, um, which is where everybody that made it through the gate that didn't like have, you know, that was going on a military bird, or didn't have a particular designation was going on to that. And I mean, it, the humanity of it, like, you know, kids are sleeping on the ground, 
there's there's you know literally piss and shit everywhere. Um, there's very little food. Um, there's just mounds of plastic bottles. Truly, truly desperate. And um, you know, and the military still had food and water. But what had happened was that. Uh, you know, word had gotten out, you know, everybody has cell phones, so word had gotten out outside the gates that things were, you know, a little a little starker than expected inside the compound. And so a lot of uh, Afghans got it through their head that they shouldn't drink or eat because they didn't want to have to, you know, essentially crap their pants or something once they got, you know, on, on base. And, you know, that wasn't exactly true. I mean, it wasn't the conditions weren't good, but um, it wasn't quite that bad. So, so you get off the plane, really, and yeah. you look out here for the first time, and you're seeing all this. And what are you fucking thinking? Well, I'm, I'm thinking that it's uh, honestly. I, I was thinking how impressive everybody was, how hard everybody was working, um, and then how bad it was on the ground. Like the media is not doing it justice. Um, you know, the the desperation outside of outside of the gate is something that I I have not ever experienced. And you know, I I did not spend a lot of time there because that wasn't my you know my job was to load load these people out, get them out, build target lists. Like I wasn't I wasn't. You know, like these troops standing on that wall, just having people beg all day, all night to please get them out. And, and, and you know, if they don't get in, they're probably going to die. What about the children, the babies? Yeah. So, you know, one of the worst, you know, one of the worst things, and, and you'll hear all of the guys that, that, uh, that went into Kabul talk about it is, um, you know, the Afghans knew that we would take children. So if it was an infant, we would take the infant. Um, because, you know, an infant is, is not dangerous. So you don't have to, you don't have to clear an infant. Um, an infant doesn't take away, uh, you know, packs on a, on a plane because they can be lap carried. Um, so we were, you know, we essentially were taking infants and so you know, not that not that the troops were trying to, but if somebody like climbed up the wall and handed you know a marine or one of the 82nd Airborne guys an infant, they were taking it. Well, people got desperate, and, and to, so that you understand, it's like uh, people were were crowd surfing babies. They were passing babies so that the babies would get up front, so that they could then you know hand them to troops. And like some people, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know what level of desperation you need to be at to do this, but there were people that threw the babies over the wall when Americans didn't take them, not realizing that on the other side of the wall was concertina. So, uh, like there were some some babies that, you know, that bled out on the concertina wire. Um, so. It's impossible to explain the uh, the level of desperation that, that people felt. Um, yeah. So you're in the hangar, your first trip there, people, they're all lined up, and then you load them onto the aircraft. Yep, yeah, so you know, a few hours after after we land, um, we, we've got a, you know, we've got a, plane full, um, 400 people, 46 babies, um, and we're, we're taking off and bringing, you know, it's just, it's literally just me, uh, with these, you know, these, these people and, um, I'm flying back to Abu Dhabi and Tim is, uh, going out, out in the wire with, um, Kevin, Gabler, and Dave. Um, and so, 
you know, I land, you know, they, they have, they have uh, five hours to prep. Um, I land back in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I get picked up, drive back to our jock, and um, I, I have my check-in with, with uh, Tim on the sat phone. And they have, uh, they have a hit time in 90 minutes, so they need a target list. So right after I get off the plane, um, I build them you know, a target list. Uh, we don't send all of the information that we have because you know, let's say it's a family of 11, they have, you know, everybody has an ID and a, and a SIM number and, you know, like all this data. We just, um, we were operating off of like, you know, a, uh, a PIN, uh, a contact number through a, a secure app, um, and then pictures of the principal. And, uh, and then they would get, get in contact, the ground team would get in contact with them off the target list and they would have near and far security checks that would change frequently. We would tell somebody to be at a certain place at a certain time, and then they had to do the far security check, and then once they got close, they had to do the near security check. Um, there, uh, there was one time where uh, the Taliban apparently, and, and I obviously wasn't there for it, but the, the Taliban spotted them uh, about five or ten minutes before our team got there. And when they got there, we the, the principals were there with their, their uh, heads cut off. Um, so the, the ground team worked their asses off. I mean, they were just pulling targets through the wire all night, nonstop, and they were coming back in the wire around the time the sun came up. Do you think that the Taliban had the list of who we were trying to get to? Is there any speculation? I don't want you to speculate. Was, was there any intel on that? So I don't think the Taliban had our list, but uh, the Taliban definitely, I mean, our own government gave the Taliban you know, whether it was on accident or on purpose, a list of people that, had, that we had worked with. Um, you know, the Taliban knew, you know, which women were educated and could read. The Taliban knew who the Christians were. Like, these are all the targets. Um, so, so, yeah, you know, it was a race against time. You know, a lot of people, including, you know, Chad Robichaud's um, interpreter, Aziz, who, who we did get out, um, you know, he was in a safe house because, like, he was a high value target for the Taliban because he had done so many missions against them. Obviously, the guys, you know, the, the, the four man team outside the wire had it worse, but, you know, even for us back in the back in the jock, you know, we were communicating with these targets before we would pass them on to the guys. And, um, you know, we'd put target packages together and we'd be talking to them and sending the information down to the ground team. But a lot of these targets would go dark. Uh, they would just go, they'd, they'd go dark. Uh, you know, a couple people were like, you know, I think they're here, and then go dark. And, and you know, it was, it, it was emotionally, um, you know, being there and not being able to affect it in that moment and knowing that, like, a lot of these people were going to die and, you know, and, and, the desperation through the, you know, through the messaging. Um, it was a lot. It was a three-hour trip from Kabul to Abu Dhabi. Um, once once the, it lands in Abu Dhabi, UAE processed all of uh, the people. They brought them into a, a really nice air-conditioned health center. Um, and in that center, they um, they did COVID tests and they they te you know, temperature and uh, infections and uh, hydration, anything that needed to happen. Um, 
and you know, once everybody was in processed through the health center, they they brought them to uh, their own rooms, and they, they were incredibly generous in this. It's not what you think of as a refugee camp. Um, air conditioned dorms, essentially. Each dorm has two beds, has a television, has a little gaming system, and has its own bathroom. Um, and so everybody was living, you know, with dignity. And so you kind of check everybody into their dorm, and um, and then you know once they're checked in, then they're they they have to stay there for a period of seven days in quarantine before they essentially unlock the floor. So they're not they're not you know they some of some of the Afghans said they felt like prisoners, but the the reasoning is the same reason why if you fly into Abu Dhabi, you're quarantined in your hotel room for a week. Uh, it's because they take COVID very seriously. We were allowed to uh, to not be quarantined and not be uh, braceleted because um, we had the backing of Senator uh, Tillis from North Carolina, and we were able to travel with a letter from Senator Tillis uh, uh, that's that asked the, the, the Sheikh to. Uh, to grant us this permission, which we were given. So, uh, just real quick, take off from Abu Dhabi, land, load up, return, unload, what's that time like? Yeah, so um, we had two charter planes and we had two C-17s. And so they were, they were essentially alternating spots. As soon as they could take off, and this is by the end, you know, by, by the last few days when we were really moving, you know, thousands a day as opposed to, um, you know, the beginning where, where it was a smaller number. Um, it's a three hour flight and, you know, three hours there, a couple hours on the ground, three hours back. We were moving the C-17s typically once a day each, each C-17 moved once a day, and then um, the charters were going in uh, two or three times a day. Their turnaround was faster. Military pilots on the C-17s? Yeah. UAE military pilots on the C-17s, um, Afghan contractors on the charters. Let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about all the outside support you got. You mentioned S Senator Tillis. Let's talk about that a little bit. Senator Tillis is, is one of the few politicians that I have a lot of respect for. Um, he had uh, he had some relationships with some interpreters. He had people that were important to him um, <clears throat> that had interpreters in country. There were uh, you know women that were outspoken uh, believers in democracy and freedom that were targets. And so uh, he knew who we all were. He knew that, that we were all serious people. And um, he gave us his unwavering support. And, uh, and he wasn't the only one. There, there, there were others. And, and, and that'll all come out in due time. But, um, you know, a number of people in Congress and the Senate the State Department, DOD, um, were happy to have us. And uh, our team evacuated 10.2% of everyone that was evacuated out of Kabul. So, you know, it was, uh, it was pretty impressive. And, you know, um, just, to, just honest to God, the most impressive group of people that I've, I've ever been around. Um, you know, and I, I was a cog in the machine. I'm not, I'm not trying to pretend like I was the guy that made anything happen. Um, I just did what I could, you know, when I got there. Uh, Gabler, impressive. Uh, just imp impressive, Had, has his shit together, hard worker, uh, knows how to use hard skills, soft skills, um, you know, technically and tactically proficient. Uh, Kevin 
is like a, a golden fucking god. Um, you know, we're not going to show him on camera, but uh, I mean, that that dude, holy shit, like he just he lost thirty seven pounds in ten days of operations um, because he didn't want to stop. He wanted to get out everybody that he could. So just talk about the what it took to go out and get the assets you were looking for. How did that come about? So there were, there were different ways. Um, if, if we got names early enough, you know, we, we got them approved, we got them on state department lists, we got them manifested, um, we were able to get those people through the gates. Um, you know, that's the, that's the easiest way. It's the, the people that had already made it to a gate then it was just a matter of getting them on the list, connecting the dots, reaching out to you know our points of contact at the gates because we had multiple soldiers and Marines that we were talking to, which um, I'm, I'm not gonna dime any of them out because I know how the military works and we're just not gonna do that. But if they were, if they were on a list, we could reach down at from the talk, you know, not even the ground guys, um, and, and let people know who to look for, here's their picture, here's whatever. Um, if they were, you know, uh, the ground guys during the day uh, hung out at gates and helped get people through, you know, that, that's the easier part of it. And then at night, um, they were using rat lines and uh, uh, basically sneaking people onto base, but with approval, um, so that they weren't headed off by the Taliban. So, you know, they were crawling through sewage, ditches, gross, you know, literally through crap, uh, under, under, you know, uh, concertina and barbed wire, um, digging holes, uh, cutting holes, you know, like, I mean, it, you know, basically the places where nobody would actually want to go, that's how they were bringing people in. And they had, they had four different good rat lines into the complex. Um, and they did, basically they did that. We did a, we did a sat check as the sun was going down. And then, um, you know, we manned, we manned the, the sat, the sat line all night um, and you know any any reports they had any support they needed there were a few times where we had to call the US and uh, and get clearance on people before we could bring them in um, and then at uh, sun up they'd call in with their their full report this is who we got in this is so you know we can cross them off of our list um, you know plan for who was going to be flying in to Abu Dhabi um, we brought in a lot of American citizens, a lot of green card holders. Uh, those folks typically uh, f would then go to DOD planes. Um, some of them uh, didn't. I think you know I, we we flew a few a few dozen American citizens ended up in Abu Dhabi, but and uh, you know we're uh, once their quarantine is over we. Uh, we're sending them back directly to the U.S. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like it was just, um, you know, the guys, we would give the guys a target package with a, with a pin, phone number, identification, so they could make sure it's the right person. They would go to the location, you know, they would, they would then coordinate via, via the number. Um, and, uh, do the near and far recognition symbol, make sure it's the right person. And then, you know, they, they'd grab a, you know, a family, move them, to, move them to the rat line and repeat nonstop for 10, 12 hours every night. So let's talk about the incident. Just get it over with. Sure. So this was, uh, this was the last night that, uh, that we got to run operations outside the wire. Um, 
But you'd been doing it for a couple of nights already, right? Yeah, yeah. It had gone, it had gone on for a total of ten nights. Um, we bought buses because we knew we were getting close to the end. So we, our team, physically bought seven buses. Um, and uh, we had we had a location for 300 orphans. We had a location for uh, about a hundred Christians, um, and then we had several high value individuals that were requested by government entities for us to pick up, and then we also had the families of. Uh, the crews that had been flying the charter airplanes. And so the guys worked all night and, and filled those buses with those individuals. And at 3.42 a.m., I got a sack call, hey, we got 300 orphans, 100 Christians, the HVTs and the, and the families of about half the the crew through the gate and we like at the time it was just Sean Lee and I awake and then Dan S uh, walked in shortly thereafter um, because Sean and I had been the all night the all night talk and we I mean we did we danced a jig like we were like you know fuck yeah like one of the happiest moments that, that I that we had during the whole event um, and then uh Tim calls on the sat phone. He's like, they're kicking them out. They're gonna kick them all out. Some fucking colonel is gonna kick all these guys out. And you know, I, I know there was a lot of pressure on the ground. So I'm trying hard not to judge somebody because his mission is not our mission. From his perspective, even though Tim wasn't the team leader, Tim was the only guy that he knew and he thought this is some fucking guy that's just showing up in Afghanistan, running seven buses in, you know, fuck this guy, I'm gonna kick him out. From our perspective, this was possibly the most valuable load of people we had brought in thus far. Um, and it was, and, and most of them were kids. You know, and uh, you know, the you know Gabler tried to talk sense into them. Um, they they said, "Hey, can we at least can we at least go through all these people and make sure we pull out the American citizens and the green card holders?" And the colonel said, "Kick them out." And uh, I called Senator Tillis. Senator Tillis called multiple generals, those generals called to the ground, but by the time the generals connected with the colonel to stop it, he had already kicked the buses off. Uh, and we don't, we did not see them again. So we heard a report that the Taliban had them. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but, but our, our connectivity to those people went dark. So that was a rough, that was a rough night. Um, it was made worse because the guys unwilling to quit tripled their efforts and worked and pulled out uh, hundreds more people that night, but they burned their window um, to get back on our planes and then at that point, um, things had gotten so bad uh, around the edge and there were threats, there were bomb threats coming in. We couldn't get those guys back in on our planes. Uh, the planes couldn't land. The, the DOD said no more, no more charter planes coming in. So that sucked because we were really getting good at this point. You know, we were, we were pulling out 
you know, 1,500, 2,000 people a day by the end. And so to have it stop right when we started to get really good was incredibly frustrating. Um, but then we had the, this other problem of our guys are forward and, you know, we can't get them back. Um, we were in the process of uh, hiring a helicopter um, to go in and pull just our team into Uzbekistan. Because your team was still in Kabul. Our ground team, our four guys are still in Kabul. I don't have the ability to fly back to Kabul to get them. And the one plane that we still had on the ground had a malfunction and there was no flight crew or anything that could do anything about it. So, so the plan was we were going to get this helicopter, you know, Dan was working on this and we were going to basically fly a Black Hawk in, pick up the guys and then uh, fly them to Uzbekistan. And then from Uzbekistan, you know, at least they weren't in mortal danger that we figure out how to get them, how to get them in. Um, luckily, uh, another organization on the ground gave our guys a lift uh, to Qatar. So um, they were they were on the bird, getting ready to go to Qatar, uh, ramp still down when um, that bomb went off, killing thirteen uh, American troops. And uh, yeah, I mean, super, super dark moment, dark moment for us. I can't imagine, you know, what it was like to be on the Marine side when all that happened. Um, it's, it hits different now than when I was younger. You know, when I was still in the military and I was in my 20s, like you felt old, but now I'm sitting here, you know, at the age of 44 and, and I say this with no malintent, I'm not trying to diminish anybody, but like when I look at a 19 year old or a 20 year old, I see a kid. Um, and I can say that because, you know, I have a 20 year old kid. Like it, it's, there's so much of their life that is left to be lived. So many things they haven't experienced, so many things they don't know. They haven't been married, they haven't had children, they haven't traveled the world, they haven't, uh, you know, found what they're good at they, they there's so much they don't know and uh you know and now they're gone and they were all kids 13 kids you know and i say that in terms of their age but what they were doing was incredible you know they were out there helping people you know giving people aid helping people get through the wire trying to do the right thing trying to represent you know themselves, the country, the military in the best way possible, like, you know, just absolute heroes. Um, and so when that happened, um, uh, we no longer had satellite communications with our team. We didn't know that they were getting on a bird uh, to Qatar. Um, they had sent a message that they had, but their message didn't go through. So in their mind, we were informed, but um, they essentially were dark for 15 hours. Right after the explosion. Right after the explosion. So Sean and I had concerns. Sean Lee and I had concerns that uh, you know, something had happened to them. They were injured. They were, they were killed or something, you know, because again, at that point, no one knew what had happened. We just, you know, we, you see over the AP, there's an explosion outside the gate. Those guys had been running outside the gate. Um, and so we didn't know. So there was a long period of time. And then, uh, when, when they finally landed in, in uh, Qatar, they got service again and the message hit, like we're taking off for Qatar. 
So I'm like, great news, like, when do you arrive? And they're like, what are you talking about? We're in Qatar. And so they, you know, 15 hours later, we found out, you know, our team, you know, everybody got out. They had a, they had a you know, a positive night of pulling people in. Um, the people they pulled in were able to get out on DOD birds. Um, so that was great news. Um, so, you know, when all was said and done, we, we evacuated over 12,000 people. Uh, 8,911 were with us at our refugee camp in Abu Dhabi. So, you know, the, this isn't like a, you know, a lot of groups are claiming a lot of numbers and hopefully they're all accurate, but like we physically have 8,911 people in Abu Dhabi. And then we ran, um, flights with our planes to other locations at the request of the State Department for another 3,200 or so. So you brought it up, so we're going to talk about it. You're 44 years old. Yeah. You haven't been in the military in how long? It's been a minute. Why'd you fucking do it? I mean, I, I know you, Nick. It's not about glory for you, but what made you leave your family behind and go do this? Yeah, you know, um, it's all going to sound cheesy. Uh, you know, America is supposed to stand for something. It's supposed to, um, you know, we're supposed to fight for something that is bigger than just being the most powerful country in the world. Like, what does that even mean? And uh, a lot of people took huge risks to try to make their country more like ours. Um, not, you know, we think about risk here, and we're talking about financial risk. We're talking about pride. We're talking about what other people might think. Um, and these people are talking about their lives their families' lives. Like if you're an interpreter and, and you, you know, and they get you, they're not just killing you. They're raping and killing your wife. They're raping and killing your kids. They're doing it in front of you before you die and then they're killing you. Um, and these people, these people believed in us and um, these people saved a lot of my friends, you know, that served in Afghanistan. And we didn't do a we we didn't do a great job of ending this war. No war is going to ever end well. And uh, this isn't some political hit, but holy shit! Like we just left these people to die. And um, you know, sometimes you just have to say, like, who else is going to do it? You know, everybody's making comments, everybody's criticizing the administration, everybody's saying this, that, or the other thing. There, you know, there's a skeleton crew of troops on the ground. And, you know, we happen to be, you know, like, for whatever reason, like, I, I because of the, the, the many silly things I've done in my life, t-shirts and movies and things that, allow people to know who I am, um, I have some connections and I have some influence and, and Tim, Tim, you know, to a much greater extent, you know, is the same. And we had the opportunity to help. And so I was either going to be sitting on my couch tweeting about how this is all fucked up or I was going to be, you know, one of the 12 people that was making it a little less fucked up and a little more American and, and, and what America is supposed to be. Um, and so I just felt like I had to go. What do you think about the news reporters that are saying the Taliban are the good guys and they're helping and they're cooperating and they're making things easier for, the, for us? 
I think that the Taliban had a vested interest in not poking the bear because they want us out and they want to they want to clear house once the press gets tired of Afghanistan. The, the Taliban are not the good guys. Um, you know, women are going to lose all their rights again. Um, education is going to be frowned upon. Um, it's going to be an Islamo-fascist re regime. Uh, there will be no religious freedom. There will be no freedom of speech. Uh, women will be covered again. Um, once the press is gone, there will be massive murder. Uh, everybody that doesn't get out or, or can't find a, a safe place to hide is going to be killed. I, I have no doubt in my mind. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm a person that has traveled all over the world. I don't, I think my, I think I'm at 52 or 53 countries now, I think 52 countries. I'm not a person that thinks like, um, you know, that there isn't value in, in other cultures, but the Taliban are, uh, you know, they reject, they, they, are, they are not educated, they are not intelligent, they are not, um, they, they are purposefully ignorant and they are confident in their ignorance and um, they're just a they're just a genuinely evil force on the planet. And you know we're trying to make this distinction now between like it wasn't you know the Taliban versus ISIS K. It's 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 not that they are the same group. It's that one group accepts the other group. You know, so like, if I know a dude's going to get murdered and I don't like the dude and I let it happen and I, when the police show up, I don't say anything, I don't point fingers and so does everyone else in the room. Like, I might not be the murderer, but I'm in on it. And that's, that's the way you should look at like ISIS and the Taliban. Like, the Taliban did not bomb you know, the the airport didn't kill those 13 troops, but they're also all right with it. What was the biggest obstacle to get uh, to getting people out? Um, the, the, the hardest thing to do was get them through the gate. The, the, the hardest thing to do was get people through the gate. Um, we were very, very good at building targeting packages. Um, we had great support from DC, both in terms of manifesting, in terms of money. Uh, you know, the folks at the Willard Hotel, you know, the folks at the Willard Hotel went above and beyond in terms of resources that they were able to give us. Um, so, you know, and we are, uh, we were a motivated group of people that are all used to doing significant things. So we were able to accomplish a lot, but getting them through the gate was incredibly challenging. It's, and, and it was just because there was a sea of humanity um, and you had to make sure that they were the right people. And, and you know, it, it was a danger to be at the gate and there's Taliban, you know, just behind the gates. And, you know, uh, that that was the bottleneck is getting them through the gate. You know, we could have, we were given roughly 29,000 requests to get people out. You know, like I said, we got out 12,000. If we, if there was a more efficient way to get them through the gate, I, I have no doubt we could have done, you know, twice that. But it, it was hard. What is going to stick with you? Um, two things will two things will stick with me. Um, the the first thing is 
how awful it is that we left so many people there that had earned, in my estimation anyway, their, their pathway to whether it's America or Europe or, or somewhere, just a better place than, than where they were. Um, because, you know, if you're an empathetic individual, you just, I don't know what I, like if my family was trapped and I knew that they were gonna, you know, kill my wife and kids and I couldn't get on a plane, you know, I don't know what the hell I would do, you know? try to leave the country, try to escape the country in the middle of the night, you know, try to find a, a rat line and get out. Um, but, you know, I mean, you just think that the first couple of days when, when people were trying to hang on to the bottom of C-17s, that's desperation that Americans, like Americans don't understand that level of desperation. I don't, I don't understand it, you know. When, when these people got on the planes, they were so bone tired, so weary that like, you know, our average flight had 30 to 50 infants on it and you, didn't, you wouldn't hear a peep for three hours. No crying baby, no whimpering, you know, and if you think about any airplane you've ever been on, there's always at least one. But they were just, you know, they were in air conditioning and, and they all got water. I'm still getting messages. Uh, I'm still getting messages from Afghanistan. Um, you know, different people that I got introduced to, people that were on our target lists asking, is there any way you can get me out? Where can I go? What do I do? And I don't have great answers. Um, I just don't have great answers for them. You know, and uh, some of the flight crew made it out. Um, some of them were able to get their families out, um, but now, you know, they've landed somewhere else and there's nothing I can do for them because, you know, they're not in Abu Dhabi, they're not on our manifest, um, you know, they've landed in some other country and they're, they're like, hey, I'm, I'm here, you know, how do I, how do I get to you and I have no control over these governments, I, you know, so they have to, these people that helped us, I mean, literally helped us right up until the very end, now have to seek asylum in some other country and while we try to work the process, you know, from here and we hope they don't get kicked back to Afghanistan because Afghanistan is now requesting that all pilots get returned to them. And I don't think the Uzbek government will do it, but they might um, because the Taliban know that everyone that's intelligent, everyone that's educated, everyone that has a skill that could leave left because those are the people that other governments also want. Um, so, you know, that's the, f the first thing is just, you know, the failure, the failure of not getting more people out and knowing that they're, they're in a bad, bad place. Um, the second thing is, how uh, how amazing um, American veterans were. I, I'm not just American veterans. Um, you know, the Brits and the Aussies uh, were truly amazing as well, but how amazing the veteran community was. Like, I don't know a single person that wasn't working something. So, you know, maybe you were sitting at, at your couch with a laptop and, and just building a target package with for the interpreters that worked with you. Um, maybe you, you know, put together a group of people that, you know, were building like spreadsheets to send down to the gates or send to the state department or, you know, send to whoever to get ratified. Um, maybe you were a group like, uh, you know, the Pineapple Express where you were, you know, a bunch of guys going outside the wire that brought 500 people into the wire, you know, or maybe you were a group like us where we, you know, we had a team outside the wire, we had airlift capacity, we had our hangar, you know, like, you know, we, we were very fortunate that, that everybody involved was able to bring significant resources to the table. But um, 
man, like I don't remember a time where the whole community came together like this, you know, and everybody worked their asses off. I mean, people were not sleeping, you know, here in the States where we were everywhere, just desperately trying to make this happen. And uh, I have never been more proud to be an American in terms of more proud of my fellow Americans and maybe less proud of my government all at the same time. I think that's what I'm going to leave with from this is, you know, the veteran community, the, the American veteran community can do anything, you know, no, no quit, no quit. And, and this, this group of people, uh, but we can't do it. We can't do it alone. Best moment. Best moment was um, there were some kids that were on one of the flights that I took out that uh, I saw these same kids a few times. Um, they, the first time I saw them, heads down, no eye contact, you know, waifish. Um, the second time I saw them was in uh, was in the health clinic day one, and they were, you know, st heads were still down, very quiet, fear in their eyes, wondering, you know, who are these, you know, who are these Americans, and you know, uh, you know, who are these these UAE folks? Are they going to hurt us? And then three days later, I see them again, at, you know, at the refugee camp, and now they're playing a little bit, and then. Yesterday, I delivered them to uh, to their, you know, literally, it's a it's an oceanside resort in Albania that Albania has rented out for these refugees. So they're in like a like a place where you would go, you'd pay to go to this place, and, and it's beautiful. And um, uh, this NGO, not, uh, Solidarity Now, um, had teachers there like children's teachers for all these kids. And they were, they were painting pictures. The goal was to paint a picture of your ideal village. And all these villages were like beautiful, happy places. Like there was no death, there was no destruction. It was the kind of thing that an American kid would draw. And then they were playing this game that they call Survivor that thankfully has nothing to do with our, our show Survivor. Um, and they're all running around and laughing and giggling uh, in this like beautiful grass in Albania on the ocean. Um, and it was like, man, like these kids would still be in Afghanistan right now, but because of our group, here they are about to have a totally healthy, normal life, um, by far the best one. Worst moment. Uh, I mean, worst moment was we kicked 500 people out out of the gate that we're pretty sure were killed or captured, and I thought, you know, uh, one of my best friends on the planet, plus uh, the rest of the four-man team, were potentially injured or dead. Uh, I have two more things to ask you. One about the egress, how how it all came to a to a to a finale there after you left uh, Abu Dhabi and took the refugees, and so let's let's, let's talk about that. Sure. So um, we evacuated twelve thousand people. Eight thousand nine hundred and eleven um, are in Abu Dhabi or arrived in Abu Dhabi. Um, we had already negotiated homes, uh, refugee homes for 5,000. So that leaves 3,911 that we're responsible for. Because the other ones went somewhere else, right? The other ones went somewhere else, that's right. So uh, what we call phase two is we need to get all of these people into homes somewhere. And so um, Tim, Myself, Chad Robichaux, and Joe Robert um, 
flew from Abu Dhabi to Albania to, de to deliver and do ADVON operations for the first 150 refugees. So we brought them, uh, we made sure that the place they were bringing them was acceptable. Um, we got to know all the players involved, we met with the consulate, um, and then we, uh, we got permission in that meeting to bring 150 more. So, so we brought 300 of those 3,911 that we were responsible for uh, to Albania, and, and that's going to be a great location. Hopefully we can bring even more, and we're working on that. Um, and then we drove from uh, Albania to Athens, Greece, and we met with some, uh, some amazing folks there, and we are hoping that Greece is also going to accept 300 folks. Um, and so, you know, we'll continue to work that. Um, we are, we're also working with a series of other states, but the, the goal is not to send them someplace where they're living in a tent and they have no opportunity for a better life. The idea is we want to put them someplace where they have dignity, where they can, you know, um, get educated, get opportunity, you know, and whether that means that they eventually, you know, through the SIV process come into the United States or whether they like their, the country that they're in and, and remain there, you know, is, is one of the things that, you know, uh, are open for discussion. Um, but right now, phase two is we got to get all these people placed into a, a, at least semi-permanent home. So the mission's not over? The mission is not over, and um, there's also still a lot of people in Afghanistan who are trying to figure out ways to get them out. It's much harder now that there's no U.S. military presence. So now you're talking about ground egress routes, places once they get to the other side, um, a much more complicated thing with more risk. So, um, but we're trying to figure it out. A lot of people um, pitched in, helped, mm -hmm. and there's a few players that made this possible. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they're reluctant to let people know what they did? Americans, Americans have been fighting in this war for 20 years. Kids have, kids have been fighting in Afghanistan for 20 years, and nobody has given a shit about it. Quietly fighting, quietly dying for 20 years. And there's a group of us that come in right at the end and help people get out because it's the right thing to do. And the, and the press is very interested in it. And I'm not gonna lie, like I'm happy to do the press because the press raises the money that we need in order to pay the bills for these refugees, which is substantial. It's a substantial bill. If, if, if the US government doesn't ever pick up the bill, then, you know, we're talking about 18 million a year to keep, you know, to, to, to manage this. So like, you know, we were doing the press, but you know, the press is interested in, in us, in the other groups like us, and you know, catchy things like the Pineapple Express. But we did substantially less than everybody that's been fighting for 20 years. And so, like, I'm super not interested in pretending that what, like, what I did was superhuman when it wasn't. You know, I, f I flew to the Middle East, I flew to Abu Dhabi, I flew to Kabul. I did it the best I could at organizing, you know, target lists, the talk, flights. Uh, you know, like, I just did, we did our best. And, the ground team did their best, and the guys at the Willard Hotel in D.C. did their best, and like, you know, it's not, I'm proud of all of us, but I also am very well aware that there are an infinite number of veterans that would have switched places with us, 
in a heartbeat. They just don't have the means or access. Uh, many of them far more qualified. So, you know, we were the guys in this time and place. We did the best we could. And I, I don't think it needs a lot more than that. 